Good day, everyone. Good day. Good day. All right. Not really a good morning because we're not morning this morning. We're actually a little bit happier than that today. No morning necessary. I wanted to uh, put up here yesterday, I was uh, real quick, and we didn't get this information out. I have an email address that you can take a picture of here, and, and, you, and you can reach me at wineandoil at yahoo.com. My name is Daniel Joseph. We're going to learn some techniques today. The, our purpose today, so you know, is to learn some, it's an advanced class to learn some tools that we can use. And so, no further ado, I want to give this floor over to David. Can we give him a warm welcome for the audience? Just let him know that everyone's appreciating him today. Thank you, David, for being here. Thank you. I'm a little slow this morning. I didn't get a lot of sleep. But uh, I seldom do. How many people are uh, President Trump's fans? How many Obamas? Oh, that's good to see. See, see uh, if, if you go visit the White House gift shop, when President Obama gave out had hats, they used to say United States. Under President Trump, they say United States of America. Okay. In the gift shop, you can buy hats just like this, minus this. This is the presidential seal. These are the ones the president hands you. Okay? So, on June 20th, I was meeting Melania in the Rose Garden for about 20 minutes, and President Trump came by and handed me this hat. And I told this story a little yesterday, but for those that don't know, I'm going to tell you again what I told him, because it's very important to what we're doing. Really quickly, I had to think of something to say, because I knew I was only going to get about this much time with him, right? So what could I say that would... That would uh, maybe make a difference. And I said this, I said, President Trump, our 2018 census here in the United States says we have 327.2 million people. And our corporate charter, our constitution, which runs government, that's how government's supposed to operate, says we need one representative in Congress for every 30,000 people. That means we need 10,907 congressmen, and we have 435. And Congress operates off the Mason's Meeting Manual, which means 435 is not a quorum when 10,907 are required, which means nothing Congress has done no law they passed, no act of Congress, is lawful. There is no government. Government ceases to exist. They are sin die. And he looked at me, and he almost brought me to tears. He says, that's right. That's why I signed an executive order, restoring the Republic of the United States of America, and now it's up to you. So what I'm trying to tell you is there's two or more of everything in this country. There's two of you. There's two cities here in Fayette. There's two counties here in Washington County. There's two states of Arkansas and there's two United States of America. There's the United States Corporation and then there's the de jure government of the United States of America that lives within each one of us. And now it's up to you. Okay? You gotta put it into effect. You gotta let the United States Corporation know that they have no authority. None. Not one of these police officers, not one of these city council members has any authority whatsoever unless you consent, unless you give it to them. And if nothing else I teach today 
matters. It's that right there. If you don't understand, you do not perceive these people as having any authority. They don't have it. The FBI has no authority. They were created in 1908 by a secretary of the Department of Justice, not an act of Congress. Our Constitution says Congress creates agencies. They have no corporate charter to even exist. And when they asked Congress for a charter, they were denied, formally. So don't be thinking of these people as authority. They were put into place to do one thing and one thing only, and that is protect the deep state and further the new world order. That's it. Okay? They handle six crimes. IMF-related crimes like banking and child and sex trafficking and other things. So they go to your police, your local police, and they come in there and they tell the police chiefs and the county sheriffs and the state patrol, they tell them if a member of the public comes in and they have one of these six crimes, you don't handle it, you call us. And we'll be, bring in the best forensics there are and we'll come in in our suits and with fanfare and advertising and we always get our man. And we'll handle it. Don't you guys handle it. Okay? And then they come in and most of the time they cover up a crime. Now, not IMF crimes. They're not going to cover that one up because they protect the banks. Because the bankers and the attorneys rule the world. Okay? All right. Nothing else I teach you. I had to say that again. All right, we got through that. Anybody read the book, Fruit from a Poisonous Tree? Okay, two, two people. All right, go get the book. Get the Law of Nations and get Fruit from a Poisonous Tree. Fruit from a Poisonous Tree was written by one of the first attorneys that I ever turned over to our side. Mel Stamper. And Mel and I are pretty good friends. And I wrote an affidavit of repudiation years and years ago. In fact, I've, I've, I've served it on seven presidents now. I send it to the President of the United States. You're not required to. You are required to send it to the Secretary of State. Every Secretary of State we've had under seven presidents has received that document. I've also sent it to every Attorney General. I send it to the Secretary of State and the Attorney General in the state I was born, and I send it to the Secretary of State and the Attorney General in the state I chose to inhabit. And every time there's a regime change, I send it again. Why do I do that? I do it because I want them to know why I'm making this decision. And hopefully, somebody in their office will read it, and hopefully it will make a difference. Well, Mel Stamper read my affidavit of repudiation, and he put it, I think it's in the second chapter of his book. Now, he changed it to fit him, and I'm happy to give it to you, and you can change it to fit you. Because there's going to be things in there that only apply to me and don't apply to you. So you've got to make it yours. It's your document. When anyone gives you an affidavit, boy, you better read it, you better study it, you better look it over, and you better know what's in it. Because if you make it yours, it's yours. It's not theirs anymore. It's yours. And you might have to defend it. So you better know what's in it. Don't take people's affidavits, change them and put them online, and then have somebody say, oh, this is David Strait's affidavit. Because there's websites out there with my affidavits that look nothing like my original affidavit. But they tell people they're mine. Okay? And they're out there. So just be careful. Ask if you don't know. Okay? 
But an affidavit of repudiation is one of the few documents that's actually required to change your status. Now, for those that aren't, weren't here yesterday, I talked a lot about status, standing, and jurisdiction. Th three most important things in the law. And we really didn't get into it enough yesterday. We talked a lot about status, but very little about standing and jurisdiction. Affidavit of repudiation is something, if you look in uh, the U.S. Code, and so, some, some people who are common law students for a long time, and they go, well, why are you using U.S. Code? Why are you using their law? Because the U.S. Code was put there for we the people to hold government accountable. Not for government to hold us accountable. See, they can't use U.S. code on an American state national. But I can use it on them. Now, they can use it on a U.S. citizen. Because that in which you create, you control. I'm a we the people, an American state national that created government. And a U.S. citizen was created by government. So if you're tired of them controlling you, you've got to know who you are. And you've got to change your status. It's one of the most important things in law. Status, standing, and jurisdiction. Say it over and over. USC, Title 8, Section 1101. Section 1101 is your definitions of status. So people think... Most police officers would like to believe there's only one status in the United States. Everybody's a U.S. citizen. Or they're an illegal. That's it. That's what they look at. Are you a U.S. citizen? Or are you illegal? No. There's lots of statuses. They list them right there. All kinds of them. You can be a United States citizen. You can be a U.S. national. You can be a state citizen, you can be a state national. You can be all kinds of different things. But there's only one with limited diplomatic immunity as per the Geneva Conventions. That's a state national. Why is that? Because we're Oregonians and Californians and Wisconsinites and Floridians and Arkansans. Okay? That's what we are. That, this is our nation state. Right? Where we choose to inhabit is our nation state once we've been there for seven years or born there. See, I was born in California. Lived there till I was five. Then my dad moved to the Oregon. And I've been an Oregonian ever since. I've traveled the entire world and I have lived in other states, especially while I was in the military. But my home is Oregon. I'm an Oregonian. I've been there the majority of my life. So I choose to inhabit Oregon. I don't reside there. I'm not a resident. You don't want to be a citizen, a person, or a resident of anything. If you do, you need CPR. Because you're dead. And that's an easy way to remember it. Citizen, person, resident. So three things any court or any perceived authority, any police officer, has to have is your tacit agreement of being those three things in order to have rule over you. In order to give you a traffic ticket, a police officer has to get your tacit agreement that you're a person, a resident, and a citizen, and he knows how to do it within 15 seconds. Can I have your driver's license, proof of insurance, registration, please? You gather them up, you hand it to them, you just gave them a tacit agreement that you're a citizen. Because you're an employee of government, and you do what your boss tells you to do when he tells you to do it. 
<laughs> That's a tough one to understand, isn't it? <laughs> Not really, everybody's shaking their hand. No, I didn't think so either. All right? So what I'm trying to say is we can be very simple in the things that we do if we use the right language and we learn over and over again. So I'm telling you right now, an affidavit of repudiation is required. I don't, if I start misspelling stuff, it's because I'm tired, okay? Is required. The second thing is you, what does the Constitution say? That we have to be safe in our papers and our effects, right? In the United States of America, we have two safety documents, depending on which jurisdiction we're in. We have a passport, and we have a driver's license. One is if we're in private, and one is if we're in public. See, again, like yesterday, Genesis 1, 26 through 28, God gave me, man, dominion over the land, the air, and the water, and this is law. Those are our three jurisdictions, and there's only three jurisdictions. Everything else is venue or locus. Okay? Say it again. Two separate jurisdictions. So when I'm traveling in private, in my private automobile upon the highways, and the reason I say this a lot is because that's where most people begin their trouble with the court systems. And once they get into the system and they get that record running up with however many tickets or DUIs or whatever, the next step is you're going into a felony of some sort, all right? And then they just keep you locked in. They love you. They, say, they love you. They can collect money off of you. They can bond you every time you get a CUSIP number from the court, all right? And they make money. They're private for-profit entities. So if you want to operate in the private, this is the document you hand them. You don't gather up your driver's license, proof of insurance, and your registration. <coughs> Leave your registration in the glove box. If you want to show them your proof of insurance card, I love to show them mine. I hold it up like this, and I go, yep, same company since 1979. And I set it right there on the console, out of his reach. I let him know I have insurance because I love my neighbor. Not because this, there's a statute that says I have to have it. It's because I want to protect my neighbor. The second one is, this is the only document I use while I'm traveling. And then you shut up. Anything else, you don't need to answer any further questions. Keep your mouth shut. Say, I don't answer questions. I said all I need to say. And you hand him the passport, he looks at it to make sure it's you, he can take it back to his car and he can scan that little code at the bottom right there, and all your information is going to pull up. Every bit of it, and then That's, some. Even if you haven't repudiated your citizenship yet, what you're saying, you know, what I'm going to tell you is this is number one. I better quit setting that pin down. And a passport is number two. You want to be a state national? If you want to be a state national, it's up to you. You have the unalienable right of self-determination. You can be whatever the heck you want to be. Okay? And that's in every human rights document there is. See, we got to know our rights. Our rights come from God. But they're written down somewhere, or how would you say it? Uh, What's that? Confirmed. They are confirmed. That's a good word. There's lots of them probably we could use. But they are confirmed in various documents throughout the world. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Amendments 1 through 27, the, the, the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights, our constitutions, our state constitutions. How many people have read their state constitution? and know it. Two, three, four. The old timers. Yeah. 
You know, guys have been doing this a while, okay, that know what they're doing. Why haven't you others read your state constitution? I read the Arkansas Constitution before I came here, and I studied it all several times. So I've read every state constitution. I've read the United States Constitution. Okay? I've read every act of Congress and every presidential speech and the entire United States Code and the entire IRS Code. You know what it says in, in the United States Title 26, which is the IRS Code? That's the second area people get into trouble is with, the, with money, <laughs> taxes, okay? They come after you. They like to take your house, okay? They make money on houses, by the way. So I know I lost $9 million in real estate during the housing market crash, 2008, 9, and 10, okay? Everything I had for 35 years, I invested in real estate. I didn't lose everything, but I lost a big chunk before I knew what I knew today. I got smarter over time, too. I hope you guys do. <laughs> Maybe by the time we're dead, we'll have learned something. <laughs> All right? But Title 26 says, which is the IRS code, by the way, says no part of this title. Not its headers, not its footnotes, not its definitions, nor its body shall be construed as law. I'll leave that with you. What did I just tell you? I told you taxes are voluntary. A 1040 form is a gift to the government. All right? There's no law that says you have to pay taxes. Why? I'll tell you why. Because we asked the federal government to provide us with 19 essential governmental services and no more. And I said this yesterday, and I'm going to say it again, especially for the new people, and no more. Why is and no more so important? Because today they provide us with at least, I don't know, 6,000 6, to 20,000 services, and they force us at gunpoint to pay for it. Okay. They're voluntary. Taxes do not fund government anyway. They go to pay interest on the debt. So they get their money from the courts. Government is funded by the Department of Justice. Ask the Department of Fiscal Services. They'll tell you that. In fact, just go to their question and answer page on their website. I'm telling you to go to the Department of Fiscal Services website. Study it. Look at their forms. Look at their sample forms. You're going to learn a lot. It's going to show sample forms. Why does it show sample forms? Because the Department of Fiscal Services website is there for one reason and one reason only. To train your court clerks. It's not general public. <laughs> Why would the general public have any need whatsoever to go to the Department of Fiscal Services website? They don't. There's nothing on there for them. Everything is for court clerks all over the nation. All right? That's what they're there for. They're the accounting arm, the, the bean counters of the treasury. They cut and write all the checks for the, the treasury. The treasury sets interest rates and, and, and keeps analytical data. Okay? The Department of Fiscal Services writes the actual checks, the treasury checks. But they also wire transfer money to the courts, and they get a lot of money because of the courts. All right? Department of Justice is the largest contributor to the federal budget by far. And it says that right on their website. Look at the sample forms. You'll see things like penal sums and examples. And you'll start to look at some of those are like, depending on the crime, $2 million, $5 million, $7 million penal sums because you were charged with a crime. That's how much the court gets to collect. Or the government on behalf of the court, through the court, gets to collect. And then the judges get paid net retention, the prosecutors get paid net retention. So those are commissions, okay? So, two things that are required. Download the DS-11 form. You can do that right from the 
State Department's website, have it on your desk or wherever you're doing this at, kitchen table. Go on the computer to coppermoonshinestills.com. How do you spell copper? Two Ps? He makes beautiful copper stills, by the way, which can be used to make diesel fuel and distill water moonshine. and moonshine. He's an hour south of us here in Alma. <laughs> huh? He's an hour south of us here in Alma. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a good man. And he's been around a long time. And uh, he keeps up. And that's important. He keeps up. So follow the directions. You'll have to go to the left-hand side and work your way down. And there's one little thing that says, I forget the exact words, but it's about freedom. You'll spot it right off the bat, OK? If you want to be free or something like that. And then he'll show you how to fill out the DS-11 and get your proper passport and then start using it when you're operating in private, which is 99% of the time for most people. I only have a driver's license because I get in a semi-truck every once in a while and I haul hay to places like California and Idaho from my ranch. If it wasn't for that, I'd throw the damn thing away. But when you're operating in commerce, you have dominion. Oops, i got to watch that mic. You have dominion over all three jurisdictions. Don't jump from one jurisdiction into the other because you think you have to always remain in common law. See, that's a big mistake of these people that they term sovereign citizens. All right? That's a terminology invented by the FBI, by the way. All right? To label you a terrorist because you are the enemy of the deep state. Anytime you stand up for your freedom and liberty, you're an enemy of the deep state. And who protects a deep state? The FBI, who has no congressional authority to even exist. Isn't that cool? See, we the people lay down the law. Not them. We the people lay down the law. We started with the law of nations. Our founding fathers knew that. Read the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers. Look at both sides of the argument. Most people just read one, the Federalist Papers. Read both sides. You'll see why this government was set up. And it was set up as a bottom-up government, starting in our townships and our neighborhoods, and then our cities, and then our counties, and then our states, and then our federal government. And what did they do? They flipped the whole thing over. And now it's United States government, state governments, county governments, city governments. They're all subsidiary corporations. Since governments chose to incorporate themselves, they must follow the same rules as any other corporation. Remember that. Okay? If you want these documents, ask, and we can give them to you. All right? You can. Get the book, Fruit from a Poisonous Tree by Melvin Stamper. It's in there. His version, but it doesn't matter. Make it yours. If you want to add things, add things that you feel are important. Now, don't go off the wagon and add a bunch of stuff that's going to get you in trouble or thrown in jail. <laughs> All right? Be reasonable, but call them out for the fraud that they are. Tell them the hardest decision you ever made, and it says that in mine, is to decide not to be a United States citizen. I was born in a military family. My grandfather was in the military. My dad was in the military. My older brother was in the military. I was in the military. My son was in the military. I grew up a patriotic son of a buck probably the most patriotic guy you'd ever meet in your life. But I didn't know what I was supposed to be patriotic to. I got that wrong, and so did my whole family for generations. We got it wrong. We didn't realize our government 
was usurped right out from under us, in eight, starting in 1861. Okay? One communist president. Now, also, don't let anybody tell you you're a sovereign citizen. If they mention those two words together in the same sentence, you call them out immediately. Say, what are you, an oxymoron? Those two words don't go together. You cannot be a sovereign and be a citizen. And every president of the United States except our blessed Obama has got up on TV and said the people are sovereign. So don't you act like that's a bad thing. Notice this is a purple pen. So is this. This is what I sign my name with. Every legal document I do is signed with this pen. Or one just like it. When the ink runs out. But it's a purple pen. Absolutely not. It's a contract pen, uh, color. Black is dead. Red is living. Put the, your thumbprint in red. Okay? Color of ink is important on a legal document. Most people don't know that. Some judges don't know that. Some prosecutors don't know that. They are compartmentalized legal idiots, just like we all are. Every one of us is a compartmentalized legal idiot. You know why? We were trained to be that way from kindergarten and probably before, when your parents started telling you obey authority. No, you obey your mother and father because you honor them. You obey your grandparents because you honor them. But question authority or anybody who is perceived authority. <laughs> okay? Nothing else I could teach you is more important than that. We have to. But don't be mean to them. Treat them as your neighbor. See, there's an important factor. Police officer walks up to my window, I roll my window down, and I start talking before he gets a chance. Very important. I say, hi, officer, how you doing? How's your day going? I hope you're being safe out there. I really want you to go home to your family at night, and I mean it. And I say it like I mean it, and I truly do, and I smile, and I let him know. We're the nicest people in the world. Especially people who want to be sovereign better be the nicest people in the world. Too many are getting shot, thrown in jail for no reason other than they were probably assholes to perceived authority. Treat people as your neighbor. Love thy neighbor and do no harm and you can't break any other law. Do you know that? Those are the only two laws we got to live by. Honor God, love thy neighbor, do no harm. That's it. That's all we got to do. And we can't break another single law out there. If I per put, like I said yesterday, if I put my turn signal on while I'm traveling down the road, it's because I want my neighbor and those around me to be safe, not because there's some stinking statute that tells me that. Rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances are not law. They're corporate bylaws. They're for employees of the corporation to follow. They're an employee handbook. Simple. Can't get any more important than those things right there. Keep the basics in your mind. You don't have to learn the details of everything. You don't. Be simple and keep it repeatable so that you can go out and do what I'm doing right here. I'm not here for my health. <laughs> it's hard on me. I work 20 hours a day, seven days a week, travel all over the country, eight, nine, 10 cities a month. Different countries I go to. I just came back from Australia and New Zealand. I've been in Canada. I've been in, in the United Kingdom. I've been in Switzerland and Sweden and Scotland and Ireland. Well, let me answer the question this way. We did not win World War II. I'm going to tell you that right now. It wasn't bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki that won World War II. It was 
December 9, 1945, we signed the United Nations Treaty. That's what stopped war. We became a United Nations country. We gave Manhattan Island in New York. Rudy Giovanni gets up on, on, on camera and he was asked, can't you do something about all those United Nations traffic tickets that New York gets? There's millions of dollars in unpaid traffic tickets. He goes, I don't have any control over Manhattan Island. That's its own city, nation, state, just like the Vatican and just like D.C. Okay? Do you know in that same document, we gave them 50 miles of land along the Mexican border on both sides. How did the United States give them 25 miles of Mexico? Answer that. Think about that for a minute. 25 miles of Mexico, 25 miles of the United States on both sides of the border, 50 miles wide is the United Nations property. And they're not even going to tell you it is. They lead us to believe. What about all those farmers that got ranches right on the border who complain all the time about the Mexicans coming across the river and illegals and coming up through their ranch? And I know a lady who just became a widow down there because her husband was killed by illegals coming onto their ranch. She says, what do I do, David? I said, buy an AR-12. Extra 10 round clips, load every other round with slug and double out buck, and keep it handy. Lean it against the front door, because you're vulnerable. You're a single woman, elderly, living alone on a ranch that borders the river with another country where there's a lot of foreign invaders. That's what I told her to do. Sound advice for all of us, by the way. All right. So, most important documents. The only two documents that are required. Is it all we should do? No. You need to do more. Why do you need to do more? Because we, one, another most important thing in law is intent. You have to have the intent to commit a crime. Very few attorneys want to bring this up in court, by the way. I uh, had an attorney that I talked to on the phone that did not want to represent me, but brought up, I believe it was what Rick Ray is, the intent and uh, corpus delecti. Mm -hmm. If you're talking one on one, they'll bring it up. But if you go in a courtroom, you'll almost never. Right. You'll almost never hear an attorney say that in courtroom. In private, a decent one, a decent moral human being that happens to be an attorney, and there are a few, but they are compartmentalized legal idiots again, will bring it up occasionally. But intent is very, very important in the law. You have to have the intent to commit a crime. I stood in a federal court on behalf of a friend who had already been convicted, went to the sentencing. I wanted to see what the sentencing was going to do. I, I, I almost rather go to sentencing than I would the actual trials. And I went on behalf of a friend to watch the sentencing and I said, hey, ask the judge where your intent was to commit a crime. And he says, your honor, can I say something? And he said, yeah. And he says, where was my intent to commit the crime? And the judge looked over at the prosecutor and goes, you did not prove intent. And he dismissed the case and we all went home. Yeah, that simple on that particular case. Not all of them are that way. Some of them you can beat them to death and you're still gonna lose, right? Because you don't have a crystal ball and you don't know what they know. And they're not gonna reveal their secrets. So you gotta watch out for bear traps. Anytime you're in a courtroom, they're full of bear traps. Don't step in one. And it's really easy to do by opening your mouth. The 
more you can remain silent, the better off you're going to be. Plead the fifth if you can. Don't say anything in the car, in the cop car, to the cop, in the interrogation room while you're being booked. Don't say any words in the jail. They record everything. Don't talk on the phone to your wife or your girlfriend while you're in the jail because they record every conversation. And they will find out by your court date. That judge will have heard every phone call conversation you've ever had. <laughs> okay? They know everything. And they listen to everything. Most people incriminate themselves prior to trial over the telephone to their family. Yeah. I don't care how good your documents are or your presentation in court and how good of actor you are. You talk to your wife over the phone at a jail. You say the wrong thing. And you can be as perfect of an attorney while you're up there and represent yourself all you want and we'll talk about that word because no one should represent themselves. You are yourself. Be yourself. Be Sue Juris. That's how we go to court. That's how a private American goes to court. We appear by special appearance only, not general appearance. You go to court sue juris. Don't you go to court pro se unless you're suing someone else, like a judge or a prosecutor, and you're trying to put them in jail. Then if you want to go pro se or pro per, you can. But even then, you're better off sue juris. But if you're defending yourself, don't ever be a pro. Because if you're a pro, you're a professional. You're a professional self. That's pro se. Or you're a professional persona. That's pro per. Yeah. You don't want to represent yourself. You are yourself. You're a man, a son of God, a living soul with full, unalienable rights when you're sued jurist. Some of you are going, well, crap, that's how I lost in court. <laughs> right? I, I'm, I'm telling you, courts are very easy to win. I've been probably in over a thousand courtrooms and lost very few. Very few. Why did you lose them? Huh? Why did you lose them? Because they can run over the top of you. And you can make one little mistake that you didn't even realize until a week later. And you think about it and you go, rap, bang ahead here. If I wouldn't have done that, I would have won. I had a judge one time, we were just walking out losers. One time, this was years ago. And he says, he says, I want you to know you almost had it. <laughs> well, thank you, judge. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> you almost had it. You want to expand on that? Tell me exactly what I did wrong so I won't make the same mistake? No. Uh -uh. <laughs> okay. You almost had it. Man, I slunk out of there after that. I thought we did really a good job and couldn't figure out why we lost. But you live and learn, right? That's what we're here on earth for anyway. Don't take it personally. If you go to jail, don't take it personally. You might be in jail just to help your fellow inmates. And God put you there for a reason. Okay? We don't know. He does all kinds of things. I, I know, a, I got a good friend named Dave Berger. Dave Berger. Dave Berger has not done anything legal in his life. Love him to death. He is a preacher man 24 hours a day. In fact, my pickup's parked at his house right now. I drive my pickup to his house, and he takes me airport, even if it's 4 o'clock in the morning. 
But Dave has no problem going to a courtroom and getting thrown in jail for contempt. <laughs> and he doesn't mind at all. It's his opportunity to teach. He gets three meals while he's in there, a bed, a place to sleep, and lots of people to talk to. And he preaches the gospel like nobody's business. He can quote scripture and verse in every verse and every book in the Bible and five different types of Bibles. Okay? Dave's a good guy. Love him to death, actually. Not many people can be that dedicated. But he's been to jail, well, I don't know, 100, 150 times? At least. He was in jail last week, just got out, in time to take me to the airport. <laughs> I'm serious. S Scott Wesley Denham, he w went to Scott's trial, and he got thrown in jail for contempt. I said, that ain't your trial, how do you do that? He goes, I ran my mouth off, because the judge committed treason. <laughs> right? I let him know. Anyway, they usually haul him out in cuffs. Almost all, every time he goes to court. Yeah. But he doesn't care. Anyway, two things required. I do lots of other things. I do a patent of nativity. Anybody know what that is? Nope. Well, it kind of is. It kind of is. But a pattern of nativity is your genealogy. It's your heritage. How long have your, has your DNA been on these shores? Nope. How about your mom? Your dad? Their grandparents? Your great-grandparents? Your great-grandparents? Great okay. Ah. Absolutely. Mine got here in 1607. Jamestown, Virginia. Then on the Mayflower, seven of my grandfathers were on the Mayflower. Seven signed the Mayflower Compact. Okay. First boat that hit these shores, as far as America was concerned, I'm not talking about the Egyptians that came. Some of them might have been my relatives too. I've traced over 19,000 of my grandmothers and grandfathers direct back over 2,000 years. I can show it to you. Let's get together for lunch. I'll show you. I'll get Ancestry.com out and I'll show you. I can go back clear to Mark Anthony, Cleopatra, before that to Pompeii. I can go back to Folk 5 who when I was in Jerusalem, visiting Christ's tomb, Folk V was king of Jerusalem in 1000 AD, and he's buried right next to Christ's tomb. He was the king of Jerusalem. He was one of my grandfathers. So, you start doing your genealogy. It's really important. Why? Everything in this world revolves around airship. Heritage. Read the Bible. <laughs> that thing is full of hierarchy, right? <clears throat> Patent and nativity says me, my parents, and their parents, tracing back to before this government was put into place. Why do I do that? Because that which came first is most important. We, we created government. My grandfathers have signed the Declaration of Independence. Was it the shot heard around the world at Concord? Signed the Mayflower Compact. Signed the Virginia Declaration. First, first legal document in this country. 1607. Okay. You start doing your genealogy, your hierarchy, 
And you can walk into court with a patent and nativity and say, hey, what right do you have to rule over me when I was here first? That in which one creates, one controls. A maximum of law. Say that 40 times this weekend, probably. That in which one creates, one controls. We, the people, created government. We laid down the law. If they don't follow that law, which is our constitutions, our declarations, and our treaties, okay, I can't spell this morning, so bear with me. My brain's not in a spelling mode. How do you spell superior? Oh, man. It might have been because I was at IHOP till 1.30 this morning with a couple trying to help them with their case. Superior, supreme, and not law. <laughs> not law is what I call rules, codes, statutes, and ordinances. They're not law, they're corporate bylaws. I should have wrote corporate bylaws on there. What is superior law? It's God's law. What is supreme law? It's our constitutions, our declarations, and our treaties. They override everything. How many people bring up the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights in the courtroom? One. One. Let's talk about that document really quick. That document was written by a private individual. A private man. One guy. And he wrote it in 1957. No, and it was adopted as a treaty here in 66. He wrote it in 1957. It took him till 1966 to get it to The Hague. Yes. It was 1976. They had a 10 year period for every country in the world to sign on to it. It wasn't going to take effect until 1976. Russia signed it in 1992, and the United States of America held out until 1993. They waited until Russia had signed the document. Now get this, we're one of the only countries that signed that document with a condition. Makes me proud. Not really. <sighs> Makes me mad is what it does. The condition we signed the document with was Articles 1 through 27, which happens to be the Bill of Rights section of the document, shall not be self-executing. What does that mean? That means they're not going to put it in our school books and teach us about it. They're not going to bring it up on our behalf in court. and They're not going to put it in any of our codes. It shall not be self-executing. But it doesn't mean that if you should learn about it, if you should bring it up in court, it says right in the document that all governments who sign the treaty at every level, right down to our local municipalities, must obey it. So I started putting in my documents. Articles 1 through 27, put them in my court documents, filed it in probably a thousand courthouses across the country. And what happened? They, start, they, for the most part, were ignoring it. So I went before The Hague, flew my butt over to the Europe with a group of people, and we told the United Nations that the United States Department of Justice and its court system is ignoring our human rights treaties. And they wrote a nice little letter to the State Department that says you better knock it off. And the State Department wrote a nice little letter to the Department of Justice saying you better knock it off. And they actually put an article in the ABA Journal telling lawyers and judges they better knock it off. 
Now, does that mean they're all going to do that? Huh? What year was that? Um, I think it was about two years ago. Yeah, not very long ago. But they said, that, at least they were told, they better knock it off. Now, are all of them going to follow that? No. Nobody's got a crystal ball. Nobody knows what they're going to do. There's bear traps everywhere. Right? Try not to step in one. <laughs> you do, you go to jail. ICCPR. International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Goes hand in hand with the uni uh, the. Thank you. My RAM's a little short this morning. I got a big hard drive, but this morning I got very little RAM to pull it up with. <laughs> International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Articles 1 through 27 is what you need to pay attention to. That's the Bill of Rights section of the document. Okay. Very, very important document. Use it in your court cases. What we're trying to talk about here today is things you should be doing, concrete things that will help any situation you're in. Don't let these judges, prosecutors, police officers, perceived authority get away with things, anything. Do not let them get away. How is, it, how is power created? It's created by vacuum. Power is created by vacuum. Yesterday I said everything in life is about good versus evil. We talked about that. And remember the triangle and the little lines below it that I said you can put it, the name of every organization in there and as people rise to the top, what happens? They get controlled by those that stepped up. It's created by a vacuum. If you guys don't step up to the plate and stop letting them get away with things. So how would we use ICCPR in practical terms. Give us a couple examples, please. One of the amendments, no one has a greater right to their child than a parent. I mean, I mean what, would you do? what would you put in an affidavit? Yeah. Would you put in a notice? Would you put in a memorandum of law? A writ, an error of quorum nobis, uh, it, whatever your document you're doing in court. If it fits your situation and what you're doing, Go to your search engine, type in ICCPR. Print off a PDF. Look at articles 1 through 27. Look at them really good. If one of them fits your situation, use it in your court document. If it's an affidavit, you know, item number 7 could be the ICCPR, a, 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 a treaty signed by the United States government, which must be followed by every municipality, says... Number six, no one has a greater right to my child than I do. Just help you in your CPS cases right there. Okay, use these documents. Our rights are unalienable. That's how unalienable should be spelled. Un, a, uh, lean, able. That's how I write it in my court documents. I'm dealing with a compartmentalized legal idiot called a judge or a prosecutor. Anybody that brings a case against somebody is a prosecutor. You can be a prosecutor. Anybody can be a prosecutor. Okay? Unalienable. Why? They cannot lean you against an unalienable right. My second amendment is my gun permit. You see? That is a right. It's a private, personal right. Nobody can take it away from me. What does it say? Shall not, that's a commandment, shall not be infringed. Right? Okay. Anything unalienable. Know what your rights are. They're all given to us by God. 
not some government, but they're written down somewhere. They're in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they're in the ICCPR, they're in our Bill of Rights, they're in our Declarations of Independence, they're in our state constitutions. They're written down. They're enumerated. Use them in all your documents. Be a belligerent claimant in person. Belligerent doesn't mean rude. I'm going to say that again. Belligerent doesn't mean to be nasty, however you want to say it. You treat them as your neighbor, and you stand firmly upon your rights. When I go into court, I don't wear a suit and a tie. I dress just like I'm dressed today. And I stand at military attention. And I put my right foot slightly forward. And when I'm talking to the judge, I talk to the judge. Just like this. And when I'm talking to the jury, I talk to the jury. And when I'm calling the prosecutor an ass and telling him he's committing capital felony treason, I look right at the prosecutor. But my feet never move. And I use my hand when I talk to him. And I talk to him just like this. With authority. They are my public servants. If you go in there all wimpy and scared and frightened, your own fear is only from a lack of knowledge. Okay? That's it. Once you can out-debate them all, you're not scared of nothing. In fact, they start shaking in their boots. You want to see judges shake? I've made them shake. I made them run out of the room. Completely run out of the room. Isn't that the same as abandoning ship when a judge does that? Absolutely. Absolutely. The captain abandoned his post. Court clerk, please dismiss this case with prejudice. And you just walk out and don't say another word. You say anything else, you've lost. Any, if you say anything between there and the door, you've lost. Don't say anything. <coughs> Plead the fifth. Every chance you get, keep your mouth shut. Most people get into trouble because they talk too much. If you don't believe me, go to YouTube and watch some Sovereign Citizen videos. Okay? God, I hate that term. You can either be sovereign or you can be a citizen, and we're all sovereigns. And there's nothing to be ashamed about that. Start writing with purple. Okay? Put a red thumbprint on your documents. Do I do that all the time? No. But I do write with purple. Sometimes I don't like to poke my finger. I've had enough pain in my life, believe me. What's that? Right forward. It's because you can put emphasis on something. Even, even an officer giving a commandment to his troops will put his right foot forward just a little bit. And he puts his weight on that foot. He talks right at them. Now, he may be screaming and yelling like my drill sergeant and cussing up a storm, but he's direct, <laughs> and he's to the point. And that's how we have to be in court, just like I'm being with you right now. Direct to the point, I'm looking you guys in the eye, and I'm pointing at you when I'm doing it. See how my gun hand follows my eyes? Don't ever take your eyes off the sights. You do, you die. Right? First thing I learned in training. You do, you die. This is how you walk through a room. Right? Yeah. This is how you do things. This is how you do things in court. Now, you don't point your gun finger, but just talk to them. Okay? They might get a little intimidated and shoot you. 
And the U.S. Marshals have tasers. And good attorneys who stand up for their clients do get tased in court. Okay? Because they become a traitor to the bar. Understand that. Go to your search engine and type in list of disbarred lawyers. That's who you want to ask for help. First of all, they're not being allowed to work, so they need the money. So they'll work cheap, and you know if they're disbarred, they've been defending their clients. Now, there might be a few criminals in there, so you do got to weed them out. But if you want to find good legal help, and I don't mean to represent you, but to offer help and suggestions and policy and procedure, because that's all they learn in school. They don't learn the law in law school. You get that? I need to say that again. I took six people in a car, physically, to two law schools. And we sat down with the administration. And we said, hey, we want to make a late in life career change. We're going to do this together. Took all six of us, walked in and sat down in their offices. And I said, here's what we need. We need a list of classes that we would need to take to get a degree in the law and pass the bar. And we went to two law schools in the same day. Lewis and Clark Law School, which seems to be all of Bill Clinton's famous attorneys that he appointed graduated, and Willamette University Law, School of Law. And we sat down with the admin and we got a list of classes. And we took them to a restaurant. We were there five hours and we analyzed all of these classes. And like any other college, 30% of them are electives courses. So you might have a Constitutional 101 that's an elective. All the rest are policy and procedure, how to remain in honor and not dishonor, language, 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 how to look things up on Westlaw, what software to use to properly write a document, how to use a computer, how to spell and write properly, punctuate, styles, Well, where's the class on the United States Code? Where's the class on our constitutions and our treaties? I'm talking about supreme law. Where's the Bible classes? There wasn't any. Lawyers do not learn the law unless they do it voluntarily and take an elective. They could take it underwater basket weaving instead. Do you understand that? How do they learn the law? Well, they pick it up as they go along. As soon as they graduate from law school and they get their bar degree, hopefully they get recruited by some big law firm. But if they don't, they go out and they hang up a shingle called a business sign and rent some office space somewhere. And mom and pop, who needs help, really needs help, maybe their kids were just taken, come in for a one hour or a half hour free consultation to get some advice. And he listens to their story. And then he watches them drive out the parking lot. As soon as they're long gone, he turns to his legal help, his, his research assistant, and he says, look up all the laws that pertain to this. Go, go to Westlaw and look up all the laws that pertain to this. What he wants is case law, not law. So he wants some statutory, but he wants mainly case law. And that's what the paralegals are taught to do, to look up and research case law. And then the lawyer sits down at his computer, and he begins a good typist. He becomes a good typist and a good speller. And he knows how to formulate a writ or a motion. That's what your attorney does. See, what he's really trained to do in law school is to a turn, to be a good actor. They get up on stage and they practice being a lawyer in courts. 
mock court trials. They get up there on stage to be a good actor. To what is an actor? I said this a couple times last couple days. What is an actor? Somebody who gets up on stage and lies convincingly enough to make you believe in the character and the plot. That is the legal definition of an actor. A liar. What is to a turn? To steal from one and turn over to an another. So by the very definition of their profession, they're liars and thieves. I can't say that enough. Let's bankrupt them all. Don't hire and pay your money to hire an attorney. Ever. Learn the <laughs> basics of law. If you want to hold court, you get in there by special appearance. Your very first document when you go to a court, everybody got this? David. Yes. Point of order, about 15 minutes till a break. Okay. Okay. You're, you're the moderator, buddy. You control the meeting because I'm not even looking at the time. I can talk till 2, 3 in the morning most times. So, very first document. You get a letter in the mail that says, you've done something wrong. <laughs> they all say that when they come in your all caps name, right? <laughs> or it's a bill. You done something wrong and you might have to appear in court in 30 days. What's the very first document you do? I'm going to put this word in there, but it's really called a notice of appearance. Do I don't have a spell? I wish somebody would come up here and write for me. I'll just tell you what to write. Really? I don't know if I've ever had anybody do that. It's your first document. Doesn't have to be long. Could be as short as one page. One page document. I, mine are usually a little more wordy. But what is a notice of appearance? It is how you are going to appear in court. Write down the word summons. See, they're summoning you into court. What does the word summons mean in the law? Uh-uh. Nope. Seance. It's seance. Summons is seance. He's going to go, how do I spell seance? I would have too. <laughs> okay, I use a dictionary when I write. I, I, I got that theory of like Einstein. I used to have a photographic memory and I put a lot of data in here. But as I'm getting older, just doesn't come out as quick, right? Hey, good job. What is a seance? They're calling the dead. They're dressed in black. This is a satanic ritual. Do you understand that? Yeah. If you don't understand that, might as well go home. Just bend over. Let them ream you every time they get a chance, because they will. Because if you don't appear and tell them ahead of time via your paperwork, what is your paperwork? What is a court of record? I say this over and over again. There's a reason. A court of record is your paperwork. It's not the brick buildings, but it's your paperwork properly served and publicly published. It's not just your paperwork. It's got to be properly served to all opposing parties and publicly published, and then you put it in the court. How do you publicly publish something? 
you record it with the county recorder if you can find one that'll do it. In Oregon, there's one county for an extra 20 bucks on top of what they normally charge. They'll record any document. I guess there's a, there's a county, I forget the name of it, in Georgia that'll record any document for 10 bucks. Lamar. Lamar County, that's right. The minute you said it, I knew. Rabali County, Montana is another one. Rabali County, Montana, the entire county was put under a God trust. Yeah. So I went to Rabali County to record my God trust. All right, we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> publicly recorded or publicly published. You can publish something by putting it in the newspaper for 21 days. That's Get it. Same as recording. You can put it on a bulletin board with witnesses who are willing to do an affidavit stating that they watched you. They're a first-hand witness and they watched you put it on the bulletin board on such and such a date at such and such a time and that it's been there 21 days. So you get affidavits. That's a hard way to do it, you know. Go ahead. You ever thought about having to sue in it? What's that? Have you ever thought about taking it to the Secretary of State's office? Of sure. State you could. Action? You could. That's inconvenient for most of America, but yeah. <laughs> you can. So there's all kind there's different ways to publicly publish something. You could you could go to Amazon and write a book with your legal documents and publish it on Amazon.com. Sell it to people if you want for 99 cents or whatever. They'll take half your profit. <laughs> but publish a, you can publish a book. Okay, So there's many ways to do that. But if summons is a seance, they are summoning the dead. They are calling the dead. It's a satanic ritual. So you have to say, wait a minute, I cannot appear by general appearance. Write general appearance down. <coughs> Most people walk into a courtroom <laughs> and they just show up. And they don't announce how they're appearing. And they don't announce in the courtroom how they're appearing. So you're there by general appearance. You answered the summons. You showed up. And the judge says, oh, I don't care what you say. You showed up, so I have jurisdiction. How them actually say that? You don't just show up. If you show up, you're under general appearance. Bad. Okay? Let's get simple here. That's bad. Special appearance. And I go one step further and I say special divine appearance. Why do I use the word divine? Because I'm a living soul. In Genesis 2, 7, And I, God, created man from the dust of the earth, and I breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Every document I have says a living soul. Is it five minutes up? Okay. We can take a break. Look at that. You see that? Not one single person stood up. That's how you know you're starting to be listening to. David? My first classes for 10 years, Hold on. there'd be 10, 20 people, once a month maybe, if I could get one together, and people would run out the door when I was done. And I learned I was making it too complicated. And I learned I was talking too fast. I used to talk really quick. Yeah, we got about five minutes before. I was just giving you five minutes heads oh. up. But I really wanted to comment on this as well, and uh, not to steal your thunder at all, not at all, just to add to. Um, I went and read quite a bit up on the subject he's talking about, about general appearance and special appearance. And uh, a special appearance is qualified, and you go back and you can find this in the Black's Law Dictionary. If you look up appearance, and there's a couple types of appearances they mention there. One is general, and one is special. General appearance, you agree to the jurisdiction of the court. Just a blank agreement to the jurisdiction of the court. A special appearance only has two things that you can do that they recognize that you're there by special appearance. A lot of people think it's like putting in Jesus' name, amen, on the end of their prayer. Oh, I'm here by special appearance. They do whatever they want. 
special appearance is qualified by only being there for two purposes. And you go back and read this for yourself, and I recommend you do. Under appearance, get into Black's Law Dictionary and look at what they're looking at, because this is what they're looking at. That's their spell book. And they'll, they'll watch you and they'll weigh you. And if you want to win, I'm just giving you an understanding of how they think. I'm not saying that it's right. I'm not saying you should think that way. I'm just telling you that's the way they think. A special appearance, you can only do two things. Does anyone know what those are? Just curious. Challenge the jurisdiction of the court. Second? Call for a summary judgment. Su sufficiency of service of process is what Black's Law says. Yeah. And, that, and that is a very interesting qualifying phrase, sufficiency of service of process. Because to have sufficiency of service of process, they have to have the correct person in the correct capacity qualified for the act with intent. All of that is part of the sufficiency of service of process. That's right. Did they actually serve you? Are you the party to that act? It is due process of law. But you want to get, talk for a few more minutes before we take a break at 1045? You can't hey, just want to throw that out there. You're the moderator. I misread your fingers. Okay. And I don't need this. You want to read it out loud? You can set the flags right there. Okay, here's on appearance. An appearance may be either general or special. The former is simply an unqualified or unrestricted submission to the jurisdiction of the court. <laughs> That's why most of you lose right there. The latter, a submission to the jurisdiction for some special purpose only, not for all purposes of the suit. Right. So what is the special purposes only? That is, first of all, determining jurisdiction. When I hold court, I ask some very specific questions of the judge. I, man, I know I just keep repeating this. It feels like I've said this a million times to me. <laughs> all right. What is the law? Where did its origins come from? How did we arrive at this thing called law where a small group of men could write something down on paper and hold me a man accountable? Judge? What is it? Let's write to keep it short. So first thing you've got to establish is what jurisdiction you're in. You're not appearing by summons or seance. You're just accepting the invitation to settle the matter. You're appearing by special divine appearance. What is that? Tell, talk about your jurisdiction. Who are you, first of all? The paperwork's got your all caps name up there, right? Is that you? No, that's your persona, your entity, your vessel. It's an investment account. <laughs> it's an it's a entity, a corporation. Whatever you want to call it, all means the same, you're in trouble. That's what it means. If you get something in the mail and you're all caps name, you're usually in trouble or you're in debt. Okay? So you say... Put your all caps name up there, State of Oregon versus David Lester Strait, all caps. And then I write two little words underneath that that says, in air. Yeah. Yeah. I let them know that's in air. Just like that. It says that right under my all caps name. And then it says, by special appearance, special divine appearance appears David Lester straight written just like that it's right out of the Chicago style manual proper language. It's, it's quantum syntax grammar. Okay. Full close stop colon gives your name importance. Your given name. That one was given to me by my mother. That one was given to me because it's my dad's brother's name. <laughs> it's 
So it was given to me by my dad. This is not a given name at all. I inherited it. I had no choice. My dad didn't have a choice. But I inherited it. So it begins a new sentence. This has the major meaning, major importance. Starts with a full stop, ends with a full stop. Technically, my name is David Lester. Has nothing to do with that. Who uses surnames? Do you know what Norwegian countries like Sweden and Norway used to do? to protect their children and their grandchildren from the king. If my name is Dave, was David Lester Strait, and I had a son, which I do, named Christopher. I'm going to shorten it to Chris. And his name is Chris David. Thank you. Whoever said that? Who said it? Yeah, who said it? Okay. Yeah. His name would have been Chris, Christopher, David, David's son. And if he had a son, and let's just say he named him David Daniel. I'm using you, Dan. David Daniel. Christoph Christison. Christopher's son. That's how we ended up with so many last names in the world. Mainly our Norwegian countries. Okay. He says, time's up. What is the SDA stand for again? Huh? SDA, where it says by SDA. Special divine appearance. I'm lazy this morning. I'm not writing it all out. Downstairs, and David, you're on. Thank you very much. <laughs> so the only problem with that is. You have to let me know when 1 o'clock is. Okay? Because I don't look at the time. Ever. Very rarely. Huh? Why? Because it doesn't mean anything to me. Sun comes up, sun goes down. Doesn't matter if it's dark, doesn't matter if it's light. You do what you have to do when you have to do it. Okay? 1.30 in the morning I was at IHOP. Okay? Helping somebody. That's what you do. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you why you're all in the room right now. On that date, NASA actually recorded it. Revelations. 12th chapter of the Bible, something happened on that day. My classes started in 1989, June, because I had six children taken from me by CPS. I had them back in three days in court. By the end of that day in court, I had them by 5 o'clock. 1989, June. And that's the day I decided I got to learn this stuff and I got to teach it and I got to share it. Because I had a mentor during that three days. They took them on a Friday night at 6 30 p.m. Saturday and Sunday, I had a mentor. It just stayed with me. Monday, I went into courtroom first thing in the morning. By 5 o'clock, I had my kids back home. That weekend almost killed me. I didn't know if I was going to kill somebody else or take my own life. It's one of the worst things ever, isn't it? You can't hardly stop from being in tears. It is a tough thing. And I am surprised that these CPS agents and police officers committing these immoral acts 
live through it, to be honest with you. Because it was everything in my moral capacity and my training and upbringing and my soul is the only reason they're still alive. Because I had the capability to show up at their house at 2 a.m. and end their life in their own kitchen in a matter of seconds without them even knowing I was there. And I didn't do it. And I don't recommend anybody do it. You don't take somebody else's life. But the fact of the matter is, they have no legal authority to do what they're doing. The laws that created Child Protective Services in the first place, which is Title IV, and ASPA say they cannot take a child from a parent without the parent's consent or unless they've been charged, tried, convicted, and found guilty of a felony under proper due process of law. And then, and only then, can they take their children and they must first search for a family member, and if the family member doesn't step up to the plate, then they can put them in foster care. And that's the laws that created those agencies in the first place. That was the intent of Congress. And yet they operate based on their own policy and feelings and bias. They look out at you and they don't like your looks or your tattoos or maybe you've got the perfect child, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, seven-year-old boy and somebody wants him. Now I'm telling you this because it hurts me. But in all the evidence I collect to go prosecute these people and put them in jail, I find attorney firms and other people that take these orders and they go out and they find usually a single mother who has a seven-year-old blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy because that's what someone wants and is willing to pay for. And they file a false report. They get CPS over there to take the kids. They handle the court case. They string the parents out, making them do all kinds of things, signing a family plan until they can terminate their parental rights And then they transfer them from one foster home to another to another until they've lost track of them. And then the attorney gathers them up and goes sells them for 40,000 bucks. This is when a guy like me wants to stop in, step in, and not just kick their door down and send them to Guantanamo for trial, but I want to end their life. You understand that? Amen. But I don't do it. Sometimes I wonder why I don't. That's a struggle daily. But when I run into evidence like that, actual, factual, documented evidence and confessions like a cassette tape where two attorneys in their office or talking about how they did it? Yeah, I've got that. Try them under the UCMJ instead of the DOJ. That's the difference. Because then it's a firing squad instead of a slap on the wrist and 90 days in jail. Because their attorneys protect their own. Okay? So, that's the difference. 689. My classes went like this. Until that date. And when that date right there happened, my classes went like this. It's like, what did I change? I actually changed clear back in here. So I was prepared for it, but I didn't know it at the time. 
right about there is where I started making it simple. For this period of time, I just figured this whole thing is very complicated. We had the money issues, the, the fraud issues of the birth certificate, we had our courts, we had all these ways that they were destroying us and eating out our substance, right? right. And so it got very complicated the more I learned because we learn over time. And at that point in time, I made a decision. I said, here I am teaching the same class, got 20 people in it, you know, go to the next town, maybe next month I get to go to one town and it's got 20 people in it. For 20 people, it's kind of expensive to pay all the expenses and sometimes have to rent a meeting hall or whatever for 20 people. So I changed. And I said, all right, let's make it simple. What can we do to make it simple? I always think that way. What can we do to make it simple? Start teaching the basics of law, L-A-W, land, air, and water. Start teaching the basics of jurisdiction. Show people how they get in trouble out there. They already know. You just got to remind them of it in a simple fashion. And then show them how they can change so that they can get out of it themselves. Because if I worked my tail off, I got really good where I could do about, I could help about maybe 12 people a month. Looks like it. too much tail on that too. About 12 people a month. If I was helping them with their individual case and their individual legal documents and the individual teaching and individual training that went along with it and how to get them to court and going in as their friend or whatever. Maybe, if I worked my tail off, I could help 12 people a month. And I said, this ain't gonna work. There's 327 million people in this country. I'm one guy. 12 people a month? You gotta be kidding me. And that's after I got good. Before, it was one over a three month period of time. <laughs> Especially if it was a federal case. Sometimes it was over a six month period of time. I helped one family. That was back in here. See, this period of time, that's it. We can't do that, guys. See, something occurred on this date. And what occurred gave us 2,000 days of awakening. 2,000 days. September 23rd this month, we will be 730 days into it. We have to wake up the whole nation in 2,000 days. According to Revelations, this, on this day, the 2,000th day, the people have risen up and governments fall. Do you understand that? We come out of her, O ye Babylon, and the governments fall. We're 700, almost 730 days into it. 23rd, we will be. It's a 2,000 day of awakening. It's the woman in the red dragon that appeared in the sky the same day, as it says in Revelations. And NASA recorded it on that day. And on that day, I watched my classes change. I watched people start waking up. And now I'm in eight, ten cities a month, different countries. Los Angeles, I had a thousand people plus in the room. In the Tacoma Dome, I had way more than that. Okay, Washington State, Idaho State, and Alabama are leading the pack. Arizona's probably fourth, Minnesota's probably fifth. Let's make Arkansas sixth, guys. Okay. But these states are changing the world. Idaho threw out their entire legislative manual. They threw out their entire regulatory manual. They said, we're going to bring back one regulation at a time that works. They got rid of thousands of regulations that didn't work. Normally, legislators just keep adding laws. Who goes in and purges them? <laughs> Nobody, right? They just tack another one on top of another one on top of another one. Idaho 
So we're going to, oops, caught that, are going to start over. Idaho says we're going to start over. Alabama is passing some fabulous laws, like they no longer issue marriage licenses. They say, go get married in the family Bible, bring it into a probate judge, and we'll properly record it for you, and you'll be married with God. Through their legislature. <laughs> you know how important that is? It's we the people standing up. We the people lay down the law. If we don't and we vacate our post as a citizen and we just go about our daily lives and we watch sports and go fishing and do things that aren't paying attention to what they're doing, corruption takes over, power takes over, greed takes over, envy takes over. The seven deadly sins take over. I said this was a war about good and evil. It truly is. Okay? Okay? And we vacate our post, and we don't pay attention, and we go fishing, or whatever it is we do, just go to work every day and try and feed our family, which is a struggle nowadays anyway, right? Power, corruption, take over. And that's what's happened. We vacated our post. Now, our, even our grandfathers vacated their post, but let me tell you the reason why. They didn't have good communication. If in 1860, if a newspaper was printed in New York, somebody in San Francisco might have got to read it three months later. Now we have the internet. I can talk to somebody in New Zealand right now. See? That's a real key for us. We had to reach this period of time in technology before it would work, before revelations would happen. We had to reach this period of time. You know how important that is, the, saying that? Now we have instant communications. You and me can communicate with everybody. We can do it instantly. And our rates of return here were maybe 1 to 2 percent. And in here they were maybe 10 to 20 percent. And now our rates of return could skyrocket. We can wake people up and say, hey, what the heck are you doing? Slap them upside the head and say, why are you claiming to be a citizen, a person, a resident? Do you know what that means? No, what does it mean? I've never been taught that. It means be the state national you were intended to be. Be an Arkansas. Right? Be proud of your state. That's what you're patriotic to. Not the state of Arkansas, the corporation, but Arkansas. Two of everything. We've got to know which one we choose. We have the unalienable right of self-determination. That's why I keep saying these things over and over and over again. I got to drum them into your brains so you will go out and be a David Strait and teach the masses. I don't care if it's five people in your living room or two people in a restaurant. But you need to start having these conversations with others. Everybody has probably in here dealt with the law in some form or another, right? How'd that work out for you? <laughs> See, if they didn't get good darn and piss you off, you wouldn't have got off the couch. You wouldn't have stopped watching football, and you wouldn't be here today. Correct? How far did you come, right? See? 2,000 days of awakening and we're 730 days in. So we got roughly 1,300 days to wake up 327.2 million people. Most of which all live in Washington, D.C. What do I mean by that? There's over 300 million people that live in Washington, D.C. 
because they live in one of the 10 districts of the District of Columbia. Don't believe me? Go get indicted in Arkansas by a federal judge. And you'll get tried in the district of D.C. By the sheer use of your zip code. See, my zip code, which is not mine, it's theirs. And I don't write it on any envelope unless it's got a box around it or brackets. Most of the time I put zip exempt. But my zip code says I'm in the 9th district of the District of Columbia. Jeez, when I go to Portland to the federal courthouse, guess what? I'm in the 9th district. There's 10 districts. Okay? You reside in the state you live. What does the word resident mean again? Someone there temporarily to do business. That's the legal definition of the word resident. Someone there temporarily to do business. What is business? It's commerce. What jurisdiction is commerce in? Water. When you go in the water, you drown and you die. You're your persona. Now, does that mean I can't write a good contract between two men? No. Nope. And we can both autograph it. What is the difference between an autograph and a signature? A signature, you're a signatory officer of your company, of your ship, of your vessel. It's your all caps name, it's your persona. If you sign here, <laughs> sign here, you are signing on behalf of your persona, your person. A guy that writes his autobiography and goes and sells it at the bookstore autographs his books as the man. We autograph our documents. A signature line is on the left side of the page, usually says signature or something else that means the same. An autograph is on the right side of the page and it usually says by. How are you doing your documents? What should it say underneath that line? Well, lots of things. It could say all, all rights retained. It could say, sued Juris. How do you argue with that? Judge says, you're in my jurisdiction. Oh, no, I'm not. Did you read my damn documents? What grade did you graduate from? You know, I love you. We can go golfing together as neighbors, but you ain't getting away with it here. See, you're my public servant. You take control in the court. It's an employee-employer relationship. Most of the time, they're the employer and they treat you like the employee because you pretend to be a U.S. citizen and you appear by general appearance. They got you. All rise for the Honorable Judge Bob Smith. And you stand up. Not me. I kick my feet up, lean back in the chair, and challenge jurisdiction right off the bat. And then when he calls your name, you hold up your birth certificate and go, I'm here by special divine appearance, Your Honor, to surrender him to the court. Bailiff, would you take this? I don't even let the bailiff take it anymore. I used to say that. Now I just walk right up through the bar to the judge's table, and I say, here. And I turn around and I go over to where I'm supposed to stand. And I stand at military attention with my foot slightly forward. I just took ownership of the court. It's my court now. It's my building. See? Your documents or your court of record, when they are properly served, 
and publicly published, then it's a court of record. Family courts are terrible, aren't they? They don't go by any rule, any law. Their own rule book says they can break their own rules. It says it right in there. <clears throat> Family courts have no jurisdiction or authority whatsoever. They're not even the bank administrators like a criminal court is. They're nothing. They're a private for-profit entity, a McDonald's franchise. Seriously. And they're telling you what you have to do with your kids and what drug testing you have to get, what psychological evaluation, and do you keep your house clean? Do you feed them properly? Now, your mother can teach you that, right? Go to your family member if you don't know, right? What are they stepping in for? What right do they have to take their kids? Man, I don't know if I can get any more upset. When I talk about that, it hurts me to the core, right? And every one of you on every block in this country knows somebody whose kids have been taken. If you don't go walk around the block and knock on doors, talk to your neighbors. We did that in Phoenix every Saturday for a few weeks, and then they couldn't take it anymore. I, that's how I woke these parents up. I say, you think you're the only one? Commit to eight hours on a Saturday. Go door knocking. Block to block to block. Knock on every house and ask them one question. Have you ever had any interaction with Child Protective Services? They average three families per block. One in six children. 800,000 children a year. 800,000 children a year. Okay, think about that. This is, this is important stuff. Okay, really important stuff. We're 730 days into the awakening. <clears throat> it's going to take every one of us dedicated to wake up 327 million people. Because I'll tell you what, have you ever seen that guy on YouTube that goes on the California piers on the beach and he interviews people and says, hey, do you, do you know who the President of the United States is? And they go, no. Right? Right, you see those videos? Crack me up. These people know nothing. Zero. Zilch. Not a nothing. Every question he asks. He can go through 20 people before he gets one person who knows the answer. Of course, California. <laughs> There's something wrong down there. But even they're waking up. The call I got the first day I was here was from a lady in California wanting me to come teach a class. So even they're waking up. This is happening whether we get involved or not. But I'm asking you to. I ain't here for my health. I'm here to train the trainers. Try and do it in a simple manner, teach you simple things in a simple way, talk quietly so that you will go tell others. It does nothing, no good if you guys all go home and go watch football or whatever it is you do. Okay? None. These kind of things I can't say enough. It's the awakening that we have to have. If you want to follow God's plan and change this world and come out of her, O ye Babylon, and stop the corruption, you better wake up. Okay. Whew. Apologize for the rant, but if I don't rant and I don't piss you off, you won't do anything about it. So. All right. Hardcore things. What do you need help with? What happened on September 23rd, 2007? NASA recorded the dragon and the lady in the sky. It's very clearly spelled out, starting in Revelation 12. But it's the day it happened. It's the day it recorded it. It's the day people who were awake felt it happening. They talked about it. 
people who knew the story and have studied the Bible and they know what's going on and what events have taken place predicted throughout history know we were at that point that it had to happen soon. We were all feeling it. Clear back in the late 1960s, early 70s when I was this big, my dad said, in some time in your lifetime, you'll see it happen. And he says, it'll be 2023. My dad said that. And I said, how the heck do you know that? I don't believe you. And I probably went 20, 30 years without believing him. How do you know? In fact, at one time I read something in the Bible that says no one can predict the day that you'll come. I believe that's true. You can't predict the time, the place, or the day. But everything else has come true. All these revelations have happened and have been proved to happen. And now we're in the 12th chapter during the 2,000 days of awakening. And we're 730 days in. And everybody who's doing this, everybody, who's doing this, that I brought this up to, says, oh my gosh, you're right. That is when things started to happen. That's when things started to take place. How about the Bundy episode? How about Mal here? Okay, little things take place where you see people standing up and then they go to court and they win and the people go, oh, ho, 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 ho. look at all the stuff they proved in this court case. How'd they do that? It's because there was a few people who taught just a few of them and they went out and proved it. And those court cases proved a tremendous amount. The government has never come after a group of people so hard as they did the Malheur trial in Portland, Oregon and the Bundy Ranch trial. And both of them included the Bundy family. And little boy Finnegan was murdered by the Oregon State Police. They didn't just murder a little boy, but they murdered three nurses in Burns that worked on little boy when they brought him in. They murdered quite a few other people, including my best friend, Blake Payne. Blake Payne walked into the Oregon State Police office and called them out personally. And then Thanksgiving Day, following little boy's murder, they did a pit maneuver and ran him off the road into a tree and killed him. I sold him horses, I sold him hay, I bought hay from him. I mean, we were both farmers in Oregon. Okay, I'm just a farm boy from a mill town. But I got one heck of a lot of education and experience. Okay, Everything that's happened to me in my life is why I'm here too, just like you. You guys came here because something happened in your life that woke you up and brought you here. You asked a question about what we can, uh, we can learn. How about an affidavit to judgment process? Okay. Let's, yeah. All right. Notice of appearance, first document. This is my process, and it's one I've developed over 30 years in a thousand courts, okay? More than a thousand. Notice of appearance. An error of Coram Nobis. What is that document? It says, hey court, you made, made some errors. You're foreign to me. I'm an American state national, a man, a living soul, and Sue Juris. You summoned the dead. All persons are equal in the law. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or black or white. That's because you're all dead. You walk into a courtroom and everybody there is dead. They're all on equal standing. Have you ever seen a dead animal on the side of the road stand up and walk away? No, a dead person can't stand. They have no standing. Zero. Until the living walk into a courtroom by special divine appearance and claim to be living, 
Now I'm the only one in the courtroom was standing, Your Honor. Guess what that made me? In charge. The boss. Sue Duras. Competent. In control. I don't care how you say it. You can say it all. It doesn't matter. That's what it makes you. If you hire an attorney to go represent your persona, you're incompetent. You're a ward of the state, a ward of the court, unable to speak for yourself. You're infirmed, a minor, or an entity. He says, sit down, shut up. Prosecutor says, you can't talk in court. Judge says, don't bring that constitution or that Bible into the courtroom. You're not a party to it. Why? Because you were created by government. Okay? That in which one creates, one controls. So what's next? Now, there's documents you do before this, the pre-documents, right? We already talked about your passport, your affidavit of repudiation. You can do a patent activity. You can do, do a deed of reconveyance on all your, all your names spelled every which way possible and record them on the land. You can do all kinds of documents. Go to Anna Von Rice's website. She'll list off a whole bunch of them you can go put it, do. What does each one of those documents do? They help you previously to prove intent. They're a, they help you to establish your intent. Something you've done previously that's a settled matter, right? They're good supporting documents. But the only two that are required are what? Notify the Secretary of State in writing of your status. So you do an affidavit of repudiation of your citizenship and you say, I am this, I am not this, and I am this. That's what you do. Could you repeat who the website was? You said was Coppermoonshinestills.com. Oh, Anna Bonrides. Anna Bonrides, yeah. Okay. Notice. And then an affidavit, we'll call this truth, affidavit of truth and facts. How do you want to do that affidavit? I'll tell you how. How does a police officer build a case against somebody? Line upon line. Precept upon precept, line upon line, just like it says in the Bible. At 4.09 p.m., I arrived upon the scene and I saw this dead woman here, and I interviewed the witnesses. And this is what the witnesses said, right? And this is who they blamed, and this is what happened. And the next day I followed up by doing this and this and this on this day, and they build a case, a timeline of events. Your affidavit of truth and facts should be a timeline of events. A little bit about, once again, the rule of three. I went over this with those that were here, those that weren't, I'm gonna say it again. The rule of three. All things in a court of law, now a judge can ask you something three times and you gotta tell them three times, minimum, minimum. So if you think you only get to tell them once and it's going to work, you're probably wrong. That's a bear trap you're stepping into. You've got to tell them everything three times. So rule of three. You can tell them once in your notice of appearance who the heck you are and who you're not. You can tell them again, and then you can tell them again. And then you can walk into court and tell them again. And that's highly advisable. Okay. If you appear properly. <laughs> if you don't appear properly, it's not advisable. Rule of three. Tell them three times. So your affidavit of truth and facts is a timeline of events. It is the truth that you're going to swear to under oath and under the penalty of perjury in your documents. Why is that so important? Because they're going to come at you with presumption, assumption, tacit agreement, and hearsay. 
four most important words you need to learn in the law is path. Path. Presumption, assumption, tacit agreement, and hearsay. Okay? You get on that path, and you're being railroaded. So you need to know it so you can avoid it. There are constitutional and jurisdictional bear traps. Presumption, assumption, tacit agreement, and hearsay. No fact or truth shall be tried in court. That's what that adds up to. Where is the first-hand witnesses? The say she did what she did or he did what he did. That's the reason that they stepped in and took her, their kids. What is the reason and who is the first-hand witness and was there a cooperating witness? It takes two. Who is willing to file a claim or a affidavit or a sworn testimony in front of a court of law Otherwise, everything they're doing is hearsay. A police officer who showed up on the scene did not witness the event. He came after the fact, and he wrote down what he believed to have happened. Can he be wrong? Heck yeah, he can be wrong, right? It's not a fact. Anything he says is a second hand at best. Okay? This, you, means you are swearing to it under the penalty of perjury. It better be yours. If you're going to take an affidavit off the internet, or from me or anybody else, you better make it yours and you better learn what it says in that document. Don't just take a 30, 60, 90 page affidavit and go file it. If you don't know what it says, you're in trouble. You, you could go to jail just for the perjury aspect. Okay? Huh? Pay for terrorism. Right. If you don't know what's in the document, you don't believe it, and it's not truth and facts, it's pay for terrorism. So an error of coram nobis is saying, hey, court, you're making some critical errors here. That's what it does. You are foreign. Have you registered under FARA, judge? not. But if you're in Arkansas, try that again, an Oregonian like me, and I step into court as a man, a sujuris, a living soul, a son of God, and I'm an Oregonian because I choose to inhabit the land, I'm not a resident, person, or citizen, and the judge takes jurisdiction when I've appeared by special Appearance, he just committed a crime, a felony. In fact, lots of them. He's deprived me of my rights under the color of law, so Title 18, Section 242. The prosecutor's helping him and the cops are helping him. That's a conspiracy to deprive me of my rights under the color of law, Section 241. These are all felonies that carry prison sentences and fines, usually around a quarter of a million apiece. Okay, t up to 10 years in prison. He's committing all kinds of felonies, right? So we notify them that, hey, buddy, this is our notice. You are a foreign court and a foreign judge in a foreign state, a foreign land, as a private for-profit entity calling themselves the whatever it is, Federal government, the state of, the county of, the city of. If you can get a Dun & Bradstreet number and a Manda.com report, supply them. Exhibit number one. <laughs> Exhibit number two. You can attach as many exhibits of evidence to support that as you want. You write number one. Blah, 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 blah. I, David Lester Strait, claim this is what happened. Number two, see attached exhibit after you write a little paragraph about something. You see, see attached 
exhibit number, and that's your document of proof. We have a problem finding the DMV report. Hey, let's, let's do the uh, questions or comments on the, um, on the microphone just so we get it for the recording. Sorry to change in midstream. We have a problem uh, finding DMV reports on uh, federal district courts. DMV reports. Dun Bradstreet. Oh, DNB. DMV report. Dun Bradstreet on on the district. We can find them on the lower courts, but the district courts are difficult. Well, that's because there's no Dun and Bradstreet number on a district court. Understand that right off the bat. They're an Article Three court. They're actually a court. Mm. And how can they be that and be foreign? Because it's up to you. There's two of everything. It's how you walk in and appear. Do you turn over jurisdiction as a general appearance or do you appear by special appearance? Do you walk in and there and say, I'm a man, a living soul, or are you a person? Everything you determine. Do you walk in there and say, Judge, I'm here by special appearance only to call a constitutional court of record and ask for a summary judgment on the truth and facts in my affidavits that are on the record. And then shut up. Now you just changed the court. Now it's an Article Three court. You see what I mean? They have to switch hats. They went from bank administrator representing the corporation and the rules, codes, and statutes, the SMU, we're in a church. Shit made up. Okay. Yeah, it's all word salad. Everything is word salad. It's crap made up. SMU. Say. Diction. Words are important to determine what juris or right law under which you are standing. They can hold a bank administrative general appearance court on a persona all they want to. If you let them. Or you can walk in by special divine appearance calling for a constitutional court of record, an Article Three court asking for a summary judgment on my court of record, which was your paperwork properly served and publicly published and filed with the court. Now you sit back and shut up. What are you going to say, Judge? You got the evidence. There's the truth and facts sworn under the oath of the penalty of perjury. Or you got his bull crap hearsay, his SMU, his word salad, his presumptions, assumptions, tacit agreement, and hearsay. How are you going to rule? See how easy it is to win in court? You've got to know how to appear. You've got to take charge. You've got to have truth and facts. You've got to let them know who you are, what they are, what is our relationship. That's it. So here's your documents. Status, standing, and jurisdiction are everything. I said that yesterday, right? They're everything in law. Everything is determined by those three things. If you don't know your status or who you are, if you don't know how to appear, if you don't know, that's standing, by the way, how to appear is standing, and you don't know what right law your words are going to be used to determine, because I can travel in private upon the highways in my automobile with nothing more than my passport as my papers and my protection, and I'm lawful. <coughs> or I can drive or operate a motor vehicle with a driver's license upon the roadways and follow the statutes, I am legal. Both of those sentences mean going down the road in a car, right? But I just separated the jurisdictions by the words I used. Get that. Most of us walk into court, we lose, because we use the wrong words. We jump back and forth with jurisdictions like we're jump rope in a rope. We're walking in the water, the land, the air. We're talking about trust. We're talking about contracts. We're talking about 
property and equity, and we jump back and forth because we don't know who we are. We don't know our status standing jurisdiction. We don't know how to control each one. So you say, what is the law? Where does origins come from? How do we arrive at this thing called law where a small group of men can put something down on paper and hold me and man accountable? Judge, can you answer the question? No. They open the door. You ask the question, they answer, they open the door. Now you can respond and rebut their answer. So you say, hold on there just a minute, Judge. Just like a school crossing guard stopping traffic. <laughs> hold on there just a minute, Judge. In Genesis 1, 26 or 28, God gave me, man, dominion over the land, air, and water. This is law. The land is common law, common to all mankind. It's property, equity, and rights. The air is ecclesiastical or canon law, which is trust law. And the water is admiralty or commerce, which is contract law. Which are the, is the right law that we're under? Which is juris? Judge, can I have an answer? Well, contract, contract law. Okay, bring forth the contract. Does it meet all eight elements of a contract? Is there a meeting in the minds? Full and honest disclosure? Full terms and conditions? Is there consideration? Is there two wedding signatures by two like kind? Is there privity of contract? Privity of contract, what does that mean? That means if you and I have a contract and you just don't want it anymore and you sell it to him, guess what? Thank you for your gift. I appreciate you paying it off. I really needed it this time in my life. But you and I, we have no contract. I really appreciate you paying him off for me. Thank you. That's the conversation I have with third-party collection agencies. Guess what? They don't call me again. Of course, I'm not in debt to anybody anymore, but if I was, it's gone. that's what I teach people. And I've had people go, <laughs> I just talked to my collection agency. I told them what you said. They said, we won't bother you anymore. Okay? It's all a matter of knowing what to say, when to say it, the right words that determine the right jurisdiction. There is no privity of contract between him and I. I signed it with him. He's got the wedding signature. He got paid. Contract's fulfilled. Sorry, buddy, about your luck. Thank you for that gift. Yeah, hospital bills. Well, that's a great one. That's what you use with hospital bills. Okay. What's that? So, bring forth the contract. Doesn't meet all eight elements of a contract? Can you prove it? The burden of proof on you, Judge. Or Mr. Prosecutor. Burden of proof on you. Where is it? If it doesn't meet all eight elements of a contract, and there are eight, by the way, not the two or three they want to lead you to believe, but there has to be a meeting of the minds, full and honest disclosure, terms and conditions of the contract, two wedding signatures, privity of contract. On and on and on, right? If you want all eight elements, I can send it to you. Okay, there's not. Court clerk, can we please dismiss the court with prejudice, judge? You agree? See ya. Case closed. Let me tell you what they're doing to people right now. It's a friend of mine, known him for several years. Navy fighter pilot, degree in physics, IQ above mine, more carrier landings in one year than any other ensign. He was awarded that. He was one of 200 men Q capable. I know you probably don't know what Q capable means. It means capable to haul nuclear weapons. Navy allows 200 people at a time in the United States Navy who are certified to carry nuclear weapons at any given moment. There's 200. Never goes over that. Never goes under that. There's, they choose 200 people. 
One retires, they put one more in. It's that simple. Q capable pilot. Highly educated man. Lived in Idaho. Drove to Massachusetts to help a friend move to Idaho that he had known for years. Pulls into a gas station in the state of New York. Police didn't like his trailer that he was moving with. In the state of Idaho, if uh, you can see the taillights on a pickup, I don't know, every state has different statutes, but if you can see the taillights on the pickup, your taillights on the trailer don't necessarily have to work. They do want the license plate light to work. Isn't that kind of weird? Anyway, they don't have to. He had one on, working, fine, and one of them had one out. He didn't even know it had one out. Cops stopped him. Asked him for his driver's license. He says, oh, you don't use a driver's license. I don't drive. He goes, I travel. The mistake he made is he didn't have the passport with him. He had a driver's license in the glove box of his car. They asked him if he could produce a passport. He says, I have one, but I misplaced it. I was in a hurry to help my friend move. Can we search your car? Nope. Nope, you do not have my consent to search my vehicle. They walked him back to a cop car. Another police officer showed up and went through his vehicle. Not the one he had a conversation with. Another one. And they found his Colt 45 service weapon. In Idaho, there's not a, not a pickup in the state that doesn't have guns in the car. That's a normal thing. Every one of them has one. <laughs> I'd be surprised if you can find one that didn't. Usually there's one under the steering wheel, one under the seat, and two in the back window, and <laughs> plenty of ammunition. Okay? That's what we do in the West. Look in my truck, you'll see the same thing. Okay? I'm prepared at all times. The only time I'm not is when I have to fly. <laughs> somewhere, and then I can, don't need it anyway, if I can get close enough, yeah. okay? So there's a little law in the state of New York that if your aunt, it's okay to have a gun in the car in New York, by the way, as long as your ammo is not within a close proximity of the gun. So you have to have your empty gun in the glove box and since he's driving a pickup, probably in the very back next to the tailgate, his ammo. And then he'd be legal. It's not in close proximity. Of course, if, if he was carjacked or mugged at the gas station and a group of gang members is chasing some lady across the street, how does he grab his weapon and go help? Right? Dial 911 and wait 20 minutes for him to get there. Crime's over in about 30 seconds in most cases. Most cases, under a minute, for sure. So what happens? They lock him up. They haul him before a judge the next day. And the judge finds him something like, it was like $1,400 for the traffic offenses. And said, we will send you a letter to tell you when you have to appear in court on the gun charge. And he takes off and he drives to Idaho. Never got a letter. Ever got a letter. He goes down to the state of Nevada and he helps another friend. <laughs> and he gets stopped by a police officer for speeding. I think he was, said he was 17 miles over the speed limit. And the police officer walks into the window and everybody speeds. The cops have to slow down to stop you in that state. It's miles of open desert road. Not another person for a long ways, or most of the time. <clears throat> and the cop says, I'm just going to give you a warning. 17 over the speed limit, no big deal. Except, I ran your plates, and you've got an outstanding warrant, and I have to hold you three days to see if the state of New York wants you or not. 
After three days, I'll turn you loose if they don't want you. On the third day, they flew him to New York. On the gun charge that happened three years ago. And this was in March of this year, I think. I'll read this and we'll know. But there's a reason I brought this, okay? Because I want to show you what they can do to you or your neighbor or your son or your daughter or your girlfriend. They can do stuff like this at a moment's notice in most states. <clears throat> so this is an important story to me. One reason is he served this country. Okay? It's very important to me. He didn't know about the corporate government when he was serving. He thought he was doing the right thing, being patriotic, loving his neighbor, protecting. Okay? So you take the intent not the act. They haul him in front of a hearing and he walks up there and they say, Fred Benz. And he says, I don't know who that is. My name is Benz Frederick Richard. You must have the wrong guy. And the judge says, take him to the county jail. We're going to order a competency test. Puts him in jail. Two or three days later, a psychologist shows up at the jail. And guess what? The psychologist says he's competent to stand trial. Got as sharp as a tack. Competent to stand trial. So the judge doesn't like that. So he orders another psych eval. And the second psychologist comes in there and asks him a bunch of questions. And guess what? They're religious questions, and they're questions just like I'm teaching you today, the right answers to that you're not a person, you're a man. And Fred says, I'm not a, I'm not a person, I'm a man. I refuse to be a person. In fact, it's a sin to be a person. If you don't believe me, read Job 32, 21 and 22. It says, be the man and not the person. Why did one author in the Bible over 2,000 years ago clearly distinguish between a person and a man. And it says, if I put a flattering title upon the man, surely he will sweep me away. In other words, it's a sin to claim to be a person. It's against your religion if you're a Christian. You might not have known that. Knowledge is key, right? For their lack of knowledge, they will be crucified or many other ways they say it in various verses of the Bible, <laughs> over and over and over again, precept upon precept, they say it over and over. Why are you persons? See, I'm teaching you not to be. I'm teaching you the very basics. If you are, you're going to get destroyed. And it's a sin to be, to claim to be a person. Most people had no idea. Right? We're people, not persons. So, to my fellow aviators, military men and women and all Americans, you tell me if this sounds like a guy who's insane. See, the second psychologist asked him political and religious questions that he answered right. When you have the knowledge I have, he answered them correctly. And the psychologist, who doesn't have a degree in the law or religion, and he probably was taken underwater basket weaving through college, marked the answers as wrong, found him delusional psychotic. And then they went back to the first psychologist and said, don't you think he could use some additional treatment? And the guy acquiesced and said, okay. And so without any due process of law, without a trial, without a jury of his peers, they put him in a maximum security Hudson River forensic maximum security psychological center. That's what it's called, long name. And you, I went there to visit him. And you go see him. And this next Friday, they're going to try and do a court order to force him to take psych drugs that literally make those guys zombies. 
there was a guy staring at the wall. He wasn't near a window. <laughs> and he was staring at the wall. And I'm sitting there talking to Fred in this big, kind of like a cafeteria. Tables and chairs, right? <clears throat> That's where you get to visit patients. And there's this guy staring at the wall over there. <laughs> and I'm kind of just glancing over looking at him. What's he doing? Fred says, that guy's really sharp. I used to play chess with him. Then they put him on the same medication they want to put me on. Now he's a zombie. You know why they do that? Because they don't want the media showing up to do a report on the hospital and not see patients who are extremely intelligent and can speak their mind and can carry on a good conversation. It's supposed to be a mental health hospital. They're supposed to have mental disabilities, so they make them look like they do by the hundreds. And they get very paid very well out of the SESTA QV trust that I explained yesterday to do it. And they do it under court order with no due process of law, no trial by a jury of his peers, no right to defend himself, no documentation. He hadn't had a chance to put in any of that. Literally, took him after the third day, the second hearing and the third day, which lasted, both of them lasted less than 15 seconds, and ordered, put in an order, the judge put in an order to put him in the mental facility. So when I read this, I want you to tell me if you think this man sounds like he belongs in a mental institution. This is his own letter, his own writing, a flyer that he made to pass out to his fellow Navy aviators at the air show coming up, the Naval Air Show coming up in Reno, Nevada. He made this flyer, mailed it to me, had me make hundreds of copies and get them out down there. So I did, or I am. It's coming up here shortly. <clears throat> 42 years ago, April 7, 1977, I, Frederick Richard Benn, swore an oath to protect and defend the Constitution for the United States of America. Sorry, I get choked up. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and to bear true faith to the same. We all took this oath. And as far as I'm concerned, there's no expiration to this oath. Many times we are thanked for our service for, to our country, but how often are we truly deserving of these things? My plight. Simply put, I challenge the jurisdiction of a state of New York court. He had 15 seconds. He said, I hereby challenge jurisdiction. I am not the person. I'm the man. This is my name. I order a psyche valve. Hearing was done. That's how long it took. Right there. And I was sent to an insane asylum. Normally, once jurisdiction is challenged, the court has to prove in writing and on the record that it is jurisdiction, or in other terms, authority to try a case. It cannot proceed until it has proven that it has the authority to make rulings and orders. I challenged the County of Saratoga, New York court on April 4th, 2019. I filed a demand for dismissal due to lack of jurisdiction. Since then, I have filed an additional four documents. He's done this now after he's been in. Okay. No ruling has been made on those doc demands to date. Thursday, August 22nd, 2019, instead of making a ruling, the court took discretion where it had none. It broke a Supreme Court ruling in Videk versus Jones of 1980, conducted no hearing. He doesn't have a law library in the insane asylum, guys. He's quoting law off the top of his head. No computer to reference anything, no phone, no smartphone, no Google. You see what I mean? Bidek versus Jones, 1980, conducted no hearing and sent me to the Mid-Hudson Forensic Psychiatric Facility in New Hampton, New York. I was not allowed to face my accusers. There was no real hearing, no real trial. I was secretly sentenced to an insane asylum. This was a star chamber type event here in America, the land we all swore to protect. This is despicable and a violation of the Fifth, Sixth, and Seventh Amendments to the Constitution. 
So my fellow brothers and sisters, is this what you signed up to protect? My crime? <laughs> I was charged with possessing a gun, which according to the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution is a right and necessary as we are all members of the militia once past the age of 15. Please do not make light of my plight. For more than two months, I have been locked up in this place where pharmaceuticals are used to re-educate the poor souls that have been sent here for incompetency. Yes, they are attempting to gain a court order forcing me to take mind-altering drugs and action prohibited by my religion. The way out of here is to adhere to their doctrines of law where the courts have the power to judge a man, not a jury of his peers per the common law. I served 14 years in the active and reserve Navy. I flew the A-7E off the forward deployed USS Midway, CV-41, a member of Air Wing 5. In July 1980, the Tail Hook Symposium awarded me the most carrier landings by any ensign in the Navy. I am an Eagle Scout, a graduate of Harvey Mudd College in Physics. I am a man with children at home and a wife of almost 27 years, and I am not happy. Yes, it is very fun flying for the Navy. We think we are standing between the enemies of America and our brothers and sisters at home. But we are allowing tyranny to occur daily upon our land. It is time to wake up and take action. Our biggest problem is our courts where we are being fleeced daily and squirreled away in insane asylums by the hundreds if we object. He has watched. He, he, he calls me on the phone two or three times a week. And he has watched good people come in, like you and I, and then put on mind-altering drugs, and they become zombies. Because they're afraid. It's a money-making scheme, and they don't want any outside visitors coming in and seeing people without severe mental difficulties. So they create them with chemical drugs pharmaceuticals. He said he's, he's never seen a place where there is more drug dealers in his entire life than the staff at Mid-Hudson Forensics. That's what he told me on the phone. They're pushing high doses, 800 plus milligrams. Well, I'll get to it. I'm telling you. You can get involved as you got involved with the military. You can pass this memo to all you know, put it on the internet, call your friends, get them involved. Read, learn, think. The corruption is all around us. It will not go away until we show it to all Americans. That's why I'm telling you here. Evil cannot stand the light of truth. These evil guys are like cockroaches. And when they're operating in the dark of their black robes in their dark, dim courtrooms, and you walk in there and you shine sunlight, they scurry into the cracks. Let me tell you, they do. When you stand in a courtroom like I stand in a courtroom, they shake and run out of the room half the time. Okay? My family is at great risk. We need financial support while I'm incarcerated. Further, I need financial help in attaining assistance. Please send whatever you can via PayPal to straightent at msn.com. He's telling you to send the money to me. He says, David, you're the only one I trust that can do this. Help me. Get me out of here. Put it this way. I've now spent, well, with Jackie and her airfare and hotels, I spent $4,150, $4,150 myself going there with my expenses to fly and stay in a hotel and rent a car and travel up to Saratoga County and stay in a hotel there and file documents. I spent eight days there. I spent $4,150. 
in costs. State of New York, your tax on a rental car was $169 for the week. That's more money that I'm going to spend for a rental car in Arkansas for these four days. That car is 20 bucks a day, 80 bucks. Okay, so just the tax in New York on a rental car was more. Everything there is more. A hotel's 200 a night if you can find a cheap one. Okay. If you know me, please send a notarized affidavit of character to the above email. Come and visit me if you want to hear it from the horse's mouth. I am not insane, delusional, nor psychotic. Ultimately, I plan a malpractice suit against everybody involved. Thank you in advance for your support. This is not about me, but rather us and our children's future. Having read this, if you do not believe we are in trouble, hear the words of Thomas Jefferson. If a nation expects to be ignorant and free in a state of civilization, it expects whatever was and what never will be. May God bless you, Frederick Richard, former Lieutenant Commander, United States Navy. <laughs> Sorry. Look at me. Look at the scars. Want to see bullet holes? I got a shot right here in the chest. I stood and defended this country in more ways than one. And nothing hurts more. And seeing a man like that have that happen to him, right? He's fallen too. Now's a good time to take a break. If you have to go to the bathroom, but it's not lunchtime yet, okay? I'll get through it. I'm just telling you, we need to help this man. We need to help her. Anybody else that needs help, we've got to step up the plate. I've spent over a million dollars of my own money since I started this. Not for my benefit, but for yours. I paid out until I had to have an agreement with my wife that my expenses at least have to be covered. <laughs> okay? Because for a long time I was doing this for free. All my airfare used to come out of my pocket. I wore out several cars <laughs> traveling around. And I can't stand it anymore. The last two years, I've helped get over 270 children back to their families. <laughs> it's not enough. Okay. I told you I was going to make you upset. <laughs> right? I came here to piss you off. I really did. I wasn't kidding. Because otherwise you're not going to get off your butts. We don't do anything unless we either get darn mad about it or fearful for our own family or a very close friend. And I'm telling you to get fearful for Fred and her. And anybody else that needs it, get off your butts. I should be able to leave here and go home. And every one of, every weekend, one of you guys ought to step up the plate and be holding the class just like this. Amen. We're almost 700 days, we're 700 days plus into it, almost 730. 23rd. 
We got 1,300 days, guys. You don't have time to sit around. You don't have time to put it off. You don't have time to spend all your life studying or watching YouTube videos. Stop it. Knock it off. Quit studying complicated crap that's going to take you years to learn. We're out of time. L A W jurisdiction. What is it? How do you appear? What documents do you file? Get this crap over with. Where's the contract, Judge? Is that the jurisdiction you're in? See, you have to establish who you are, your status. You have to establish your standing. You have to establish which jurisdiction you're in, what words you use to determine it. In other words, legalese. Jeez, attorneys came up with a whole word for that called legal ease. It's words we use that determines the jurisdiction we're in. You get that? It's language. It's English language. We don't, we were never taught the English language. How many people know to put a full colon in front of their name? I had to read the Chicago Styles Manual 15 times to figure that out. And listen to David Wynn Miller and a whole heck of a lot. And when he died, I went to his funeral. Okay? Parse syntax grammar was so far ahead of its time, and he proved it in so many instances, and so many times the court just ignored him because they didn't know the language. They were compartmentalized legal idiots. And they are. All of them are. We all are. But a lot of us could be working for the county or the sheriff's department or an attorney or a court or whatever or a paralegal. I don't know what you guys do. I don't care. But if you are, if you're a real estate agent, a title officer, an appraiser, you're in a conspiracy to defraud. You're part of it. You're one of the actual criminals stealing from the people your neighbors, yourself, your grandmothers, your brothers and sisters. You're in a conspiracy to defraud and you don't even know it because you've been a compartmentalized legal idiot your whole life, so wake up. See, this is the reason a con man who wants to pull off a con job and rip off millions of people doesn't tell the people he has to hire to help him do it what the con is. He doesn't tell them that. He doesn't tell them, lay it all out. He doesn't lay it all out. He compartmentalizes each person and says, you're the getaway driver, and you're this, and you're that, and you're whatever. And then, that's a conspiracy to defraud. And each one of them go to work every day for eight hours, and they go home, and they get to spend it with their family, and they sleep okay, and they get a paycheck at the end of the month, and they're happy. Because they don't even realize that they are stealing from everyone else. Compartmentalized legal idiots. You could be an appraiser, a cartographer at the county, a county recorder, a court clerk. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of positions out there where you're part of the conspiracy to defraud and you don't even know it. How does that make you feel? See, I guarantee you, nobody else who's ever going to come talk to you talks to you like I talk to you. Very few of them look you in the eye, pay attention, plan their pauses, slow their voice down, give you time to think in between what I'm saying. Because if I just rattle stuff off, I could rattle stuff off the top of my head all day long, and we could just argue about it, and I'd win every debate. And I could do it quickly. But if I talk to you the way I'm talking to you with the, my heart, and my soul, and my beliefs. Well, now we're all friends. We're family. We're neighbors. See? And maybe I can get you off your butts, because it's hard. I, I admire you guys for just even being able to sit this long. And a little while ago, I was flat shocked when I said, hey, let's all take a break, and not a single person stood up. And I paused for a few seconds, and not a single person stood up. 
Do you understand what that is to a guy like me who's a speaker talking to a group? In Utah, I put on the same class, said different things. But it was a 6 to 9 p.m. on a Friday and an all-day Saturday, and then it was Sunday too. And we started at 6, and we ended at about 3.30 in the morning, because I told them I'd talk as long as you guys will sit there and listen. And people were going out their cars and getting their sleep bags and rolling them out on the floor. <laughs> and the next morning, we all got up and had breakfast together at 8 o'clock, because the good person that put it on brought a bunch of food. And the ladies worked at it, and they prepared it for everybody. And we all got done eating, and we were an hour early. So I started talking. I walked back up there, and I said, man, I'm tired. But nobody wants to leave. All right, let's cover something else. Want to cover land patents? Property? You tell me what you guys want to cover. I'll cover it. I can talk on any of these subjects, all right? But nobody got up. All day Sunday, we were supposed to end at 5. We quit at 9.30. Nobody wanted to leave. Nobody wanted to go home. A couple people said, David, you need help with your horses at your ranch? I can come live on your property for a while just so you'll be my mentor. <laughs> okay. I don't think I'm that special. I just think that I say things in a way that you need to learn to say things. Because when you do, you'll become effective, and you'll start filling classrooms. And we've got 1,300 days, guys. Don't believe me, read, start at Revelations 12, and don't take my word for it. Watch, and you'll figure it out. We've got 1,300 days. How are we doing on time? We've got 15 minutes left. We've got a question here. You never made it to advocate it to judgment. Okay, question first. In regards to your friend who's in that institution, could, could you please let us know, I know we got to reach people and let them know and educate them about this, but particular things that we can do to unite our efforts towards that brother, whether it seems to me like we have an administration right now who, you know, with all due respect, you know, the Kardashians and them can go in and get people out of jail. Can we, for one thing, reach out to the Trump money? reach out to the Trump administration and, and let them know about this. It seems like there's further Believe me, I have. Them. I've called two admirals, two three-star generals, many lieutenant commanders, and I've told them the situation. We're going to pass all, a whole bunch of flyers out in Reno at the air show. That's a naval air show, by the way. I just flew a good friend, a paralegal out of Utah, on my dime personally, and she's staying at, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the hotel, doesn't matter, it's right there, there's one in New Hampton, right three miles from the forensics facility. Because when I walked into Saratoga County and I presented documents and I talked to his public defender, When I left and I walked out and I got on the elevator and I went downstairs to walk out to the parking lot, as I'm walking to the outside door of the building, I see the public defender who I was just in the office with had taken the stairs and beat me down and he's putting his coat on as he's running through the quad and I says, hey, where are you going? I didn't scare you off, did I? He said, no, I'm going to go see the judge. He retired a week later. 23 years as a public defender. And he decided enough is enough because of my conversation with him. In 23 years as a public defender, I'm the first guy who laid down the law for him in his office to his face. Scared the holy crap out of him. I served him with an error quorum nobis and a notice of appearance. He ran and tattled on the judge. I said, I'm there by executive order. 
just came from, flew up here from DC. And I scared him to death. Okay. I tried to scan it in the computer and old Fred put it on orange paper. And you know what it looked like when it scanned in? It doesn't scan very well. Couldn't read it at all. But if we could get a copy of that, we could send it out to everybody on our email list. And uh, I think that might help our case here to make people mad, as well as to help that gentleman. I got that in the day, the day before I flew here in the mail at my house. Fred sent that to me, along with his psychological reports and his court order where they're going to try and put him on drugs. And David, once again, I'll make it really clear that everything that David gives me to give to you will be on the... My house shall be called dot com, including that document. So, Anybody got a copy machine? Yeah, I've got one at the office, and I'll just before I, you mean before you leave, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Okay, it'll be there. It's the only copy I have. I won't lose it. It's folded that way because he put it in an envelope and sent it to me. <clears throat> okay. Once you do the affidavit. They have time to respond, right? They might have got it at 5 p.m. on certain, certain day, right? So on the 22nd day, make sure you give them a full 21 days. You do a... If you haven't already in your document, you can do a certified proof of service in your document. But if you haven't, on the 22nd day, do a certified proof of service. And you also do a certified proof of judgment of unrebutted affidavit. You judgment your affidavit. Lots of people do affidavits and they never follow through. Ever follow through. They don't certify their proof of service. What did I say? Your documents are a court of record and once they are properly served and publicly published. Now, they didn't respond. They did respond great. Just answer them back. Go through the process one more time. Repeat if they answer. Repeat. Rebut their answers. What are courts? Courts are banks. In banking, you have a 72-hour right of rescission. You get a letter in the mail or you get stopped by a police officer by a car and they give you a ticket. You got 72 hours to take a red sharpie across the face of the ticket and say, your offer to contract is not accepted. While traveling in private in my private automobile upon the roadways, you are operating under Title 18, Section 241 and 242 is a conspiracy to deprive me of my rights under the color of law and you mail it to the court so that they receive it within 72 hours. If you don't think they'll receive it in 72 hours because you screwed up and waited 48 to mail it or it was a weekend or something, you do an affidavit of certification that you mailed it within 72 hours and you send it with it to make sure. Might be a good idea to make sure even if you mailed it that same day in case the post office screws up and lets it sit somewhere. Okay? Because otherwise you've got to go defend your postage stamp and all that stuff, right? So, 
send it in, resend the ticket. You're, you were traveling, operating in private upon the highways, and they thought you were in commerce. Did he walk up to the window and say, hey, are you operating in private or traveling or are you in commerce? No, so, so since he failed to do his job and ask that question before he proceeded to write the ticket, then he just gave you one, say thanks. I'll take care of this by mail today and it'll go away. Sorry you wasted your time, officer. Have a nice day. And you just write with a red Sharpie. I carry red Sharpies and purple pens in my car. Okay? I carry a file folder in my car with about 60 pages of case law saying I can travel upon the roadways without a driver's license. And if he really wants an education, I'm happy to give it. Read this, officer. Here, read this. Here's, here's a whole file folder. Take that home with you. Read it. I can print another one off tomorrow. 60 pages of case law of every state in the United States and the Supreme Court cases and everything else that says I have every right if I present you with a passport to travel freely upon the roadways. I presented it at toll booths. Told the toll lady, hey, here's my passport. I'm not going to be charged a toll today. I am free to travel upon the roadways. Probably saved me 160 bucks while I was in New York. So every time you pull off the freeway, see, yeah, here, here's a little key to all this. The interstate highways going through New York don't have toll booths. The toll booths are on the exits. They get you for interstate commerce once you enter the state of New York. A little key to this whole thing right there. Now Chicago, on the other hand, Illinois, we already talked about it being a communist state, right? That's different. All right. Judgment of unrebutted affidavit. Now what? You publicly served it, publicly published it, filed it up with the court, and now you do a notice of, and I'm assuming you by this time you're all going to be state nationals. A notice of foreign judgment. Hey, judge, I went through the administrative process and I just judgmented all my documents. In my documents, I stated a remedy. Okay, don't forget this. In your affidavits, you must state a remedy. Remember where I was telling you the story about when my kids were taken? And I'm standing at the desk as a 26-year-old snot-nosed kid just out of the military? And the judge says, well, this is your court. You called it emergency hearing. We're in his chambers, right? Not all of you heard this, I don't think. And he goes, well, what do you want to have happen here? And I said, well, I want my kids back by 5 o'clock today, and I want him fired. And I was talking, pointing to the CPS worker. And the judge says, okay. Have his kids home by 5 o'clock and give me your resignation. I felt so bad about that at 26 years old that I called the guy the next day and said, I apologize for you losing your job. He says, I've been here 23 years working for the state of Oregon as a CPS agent, and I'm darn glad to see you did what you did. He says, I was so sick and tired of kidnapping other people's kids that I couldn't hardly live with myself. You did me a favor, kid. <laughs> 